students. Welcome to our module six lecture entitled Water and Sanitation Around the Globe. I very much enjoyed your uh, midterm presentations uh, focusing on half the sky and women's oppression. Thank you so much for thinking out of the box, being creative, really taking your time to um, explore each of your issues within your group. They were really impressive. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So I hope you're back rested. We have another month or so um, or two left in school and hope it'll be great. So um, without further ado, let's talk about um, water and sanitation around the globe. What I'd love to do is um, share with you a little bit about um, our lecture, then highlight our case study that we will be discussing um, this module, Preventing Diarrheal Deaths in Egypt. Then I'd like to talk to you about your final project. You're coming along, you're doing great. You've completed three of the 10 components. And today we're gonna to be focusing on uh, your purpose, goals, and objectives, as well as your outcome your results and these two components work together. So we'll be doing that towards the end of the presentation. As we, um, as I go through this presentation, I'd love you to think about a couple of things. One, how much water do you, you use every day? How much water is required to produce the things that you rely on each day? How much water uh, was required to make this dress? How much water was required to um, produce an apple, to produce your steak dinner. How much water to guard? Have you ever really thought about that? And what if you didn't have water? What if you didn't have clean water? What if you um, didn't have any water at all for yourselves or for your families? What would you do? And what is one of the critical defining separators between developed and developing nations? I really think it's more, you know, water, clean water, and the separation between clean and not clean water, especially um, with um, restrooms and making sure that restrooms are kept far away from um, drinking water. Um, also, how is unsafe water related to the spread of disease? Why is it important to promote hand washing? Why do we need to wash our hands? How does the availability of water keep girls and women enslaved? How can we overcome that? And how does better sanitation contribute to economic development? And we'll explore um, many of these issues in the lecture today, but I just want you to keep these in mind and think about them as we go through the presentation. So um, I want to start the lecture with my own experience, as I do many times, um, how water and sanitation I've never really thought about. And at one point in my life, they became absolutely the most important facts I could ever think about. Um, and this was when I went to um, volunteer with World Teach in Thailand. And uh, before then, you know, you turn on the water, you go to the restroom, the dirty water is gone. You always have fresh water available. You rarely get sick from contaminated water. But uh, I remember in my orientation, my orientation leader, who was Thai, said, um, you know, I want to talk to you about bathroom etiquette. And uh, one thing of importance is that um, you're not going to, most likely will not have Western toilets. You'll have Eastern toilets where more, you know, and we have a very international group here. So I'll just go quickly because I'm sure you've all experienced this. But and a more Eastern toilet is, you know, it's uh, flat on the ground and it's got a hole with two places for your feet. And um, I've actually come quite a two, I love those bathrooms, so it's great. But um, he said, you may um, come into contact with the um, more Eastern types of bathrooms. You may have limited access to water. You may not have toilet paper, you may not have soap, etc." So I thought, well, it's not a big deal. Um, and my first day of school, we had to wear the Thai military uniform for Mondays and Thursdays, which is a very tight, khaki outfit that goes long and tight and it's not very comfortable and it's got medals and medallions from the Thai government. Um, it's very thin and anyway, um, I went to work my first day and was shown the restroom and I thought, oh, it's a Western toilet. Well, that's great. We're in the middle of a, you know, in the countryside, but they have Western toilet. That's fantastic. So then I came back later to use the restroom and um, went to look at the toilet and it was in the dry season. and. There was no water in the toilet. 
<laughs> which was interesting. And there was no um, toilet paper and there was no, uh, there was no soap. And then I turned on the water and there was no water. So here I've got a Western toilet, but I really can't use it. So um, I went to the kids area where the students were and they had a more Eastern toilet with a big um, bucket of water, like in this picture here. Oops, sorry about that. And, um, oh goodness. And with a, a bucket where you would use the restroom and just wash down with a bucket. That was fine for me, but it was funny that I thought I had a, you know, this Western toilet, but actually there was no water. And the funny thing was when I came back to the toilet, I always saw footprints on the top of the Western toilet on the toilet uh, rim because the tires were accustomed to squatting and so they had squat on top of the toilet, which I thought was kind of funny, but there's never any water, so you could never really use it. And the other issue I think I um, may have explained to you, I was living with uh, in Thai housing with other teachers, which was great, except I had a roommate who was a little bit more challenging, a Thai roommate, and she loved to follow me around and point out how everything I was doing was against Thai culture, and I was trying so hard, but everything was wrong. So I decided to move out and I lived with Thai college art students who were wonderful. And that's how I learned to speak Thai. But um, one day we went to, I went to get ready for work and there was no water in our shower and there was no water in the sink. And I said, well, how do we take a shower? I've got to go to work in a half an hour. I said, go to the back. And I, I think I shared this with you, but there were some big urns of water in our backyard that have been collecting rainwater. And what you're supposed to do is collect the rainwater and then cover them with lids to make sure that bugs don't get into them. Well, living with Thai art students, you know, everyone was in their early 20s, they forgot to put the lids back on the urn, so they were infested with mosquito larvae and all different types of bugs. And so that's the one I had to use to up nom, as it's called, to shower. So I put on my sarong, went out to the back, up nom in the water, but then said, where do I brush my teeth? And they said, you use that water. And I had to put my toothbrush into the water and there were mosquito larvae all over my toothpaste. And I had to push them off my toothpaste and brush my teeth. And I remember just the whole day thinking, I've got mosquito larvae in my mouth, in my hair, swimming around. It was, um, it was quite comical, but anyway. So um, water has always been interesting, very interesting for me. And the last thing was the location of toilets. I dated a great Thai, um, gentleman and for years and he, I went to his house in the rural village and they had a house on stilts and their bathroom was outside next to a brick kitchen and so their bathroom was right the bathroom was right here and the kitchen was right next to them so they would squat on the ground and pound the meat and I would be not even this much farther in the toilet in the, in the bathroom and we were separated by, you know, two feet and then a, a little rim up to here. And I thought, oh, my goodness, they're cooking here on the floor and the bathroom's here. That's not a great separation. <laughs> so I always thought I would get, uh, I might get sick one day. But anyway, so I, I love water. And then also the dry season, one day you have water. Then for three or four months, you have no water. And you have to figure out where you're going to buy water, if you have a truck coming, et cetera. So anyway, I appreciate water every day. I appreciate toilets. I appreciate everything about sanitation now that I've had that experience, and I'm sure many of you have as well. But anyway, that's my own personal experience. So let's keep going with the presentation. <laughs> so here are some 20 amazing water facts um, highlighted. Our global water crisis, water and sanitation facts. One in 10 people lack access to safe water. One in 10, one in 10 people. I've also seen that as one in nine, depending on how you define the people and the safe water. But about approximately one in 10 people lack access to safe water, one in three people lack access to a toilet. And um, the planet needs 200 million liters of water every second to grow food. Um, if the world's water was a four liter jug, accessible fresh water would account for just one tablespoon. And across the world, women and children spend a collective hour of 140 million hours each day fetching water. That's a lot. That is a lot. And also every 90 seconds, a child dies from a water-related disease. Every 90 seconds. Think about that. A child dies. With access to safe water and sanitation, children can lead fuller, healthier lives. 
And these facts are from a fantastic organization that I absolutely love called water.org. Take a look at it on the website if you get a chance. They've got great um, YouTube videos, great facts. It's run by Matt Damon. And I, I've incorporated a number of their uh, videos in the presentation today. And this is where I talk about Matt Damon. He used his celebrity status to co-found water.org to bring attention to the dire need for water by um, partnering with some key folks from water.org. And he's done a lot to promote um, the importance of fresh water um, and a number of water-related um, facts around the world. Um, and this is, you can take a look at their website, but it's really, really a great organization. World Water Day is March 22nd, and so I thought this is a relevant lecture to present. We all need to be thinking out water. So we have two um, pre, uh, YouTube presentations. They're on the bottom here, but um, we can also access them through our um, through the hyperlink. Which we'll do in just a moment. They're not working. Oh, here we go. Okay, so anyway, World Water Day, remember uh, the 22nd. Think about water, do something great for water on the 22nd. And here's another video. Let me see if this one will work. Ugh. Water. Precious water. Life thrives when it is abundant. Water is a sacred element that makes all life possible for humanity, for plants, and for animals. Water unifies us. 78% of the Earth's surface is water, yet only 0.01% is fresh and drinkable. Access to clean water should be a fundamental right even for those who have no voice with which to express that. Too often, we take this precious resource for granted. We have polluted almost 95% of all fresh water on the planet. Water has become a dumping ground for waste generated by our cities. Right now, at this exact moment, there are 800 million of us who do not have clean drinking water. More people die every year from waterborne illnesses than from war. The good news is, just as water can change course, so can we. We can clean up our water supplies, and we can make clean water accessible to everyone. We can realize that water is alive, and loving water changes our relationship to it. Water is one body as it changes from rain to river to ocean and we are part of this body. Together, we can make all water sacred again. On Sunday, March 22nd, World Water Day, we ask you to love water with us. Millions of us will unify in a global synchronized water ceremony and take action together. Last year, 309 communities around the world meditated, prayed, and held ceremony at sacred sources of water in their region. 
Join the wave of intention moving across our planet and organize an event in your city. This year, we also invite you to collaborate with local water organizations to create lasting change. And tune in online at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for the global meditation and live broadcast from the banks of the Ganges River in India. Go to upliftconnect.com to sign up for the global broadcast. When water flows together, it is powerful, capable of creating great change. We are water, and together we create change. Visit unify.org to learn more. So actually, I hope you like those two videos. Um, today is actually March 22nd. And um, so I wanted to make sure I was filming today. So do something great today, I hope. Um, I also wanted to share with you another video, believe it or not. But I thought this was fascinating. This is, you know, I love TED Talks. Um, they're just, they've always got phenomenal, very, very interesting um, talks. And this is a, a, one of our older, one of their older talks by Stephen Johnson. And it talks about the tour, he tours the ghost map. And it talks about the history of um, water and London and cholera in the 1850s, and it is fascinating. So, um, hope you enjoy this. If you haven't ordered yet, um... <laughs> I generally find the rigatoni with the spicy uh, tomato sauce goes best with diseases of the uh, small intestine. Uh, so, sorry, it just feels like I should be doing stand-up up here because of this setting. Now, I, I, what I want to do is, is take you back uh, to 1854 in London uh, for the next few minutes and, and tell the story uh, in brief of this, of this outbreak, um, which in many ways I think helped create the world that we live in today, and, and, and particularly the kind of city that we live in today. This period in, in 1854, in, in, in the you know, middle part of the 19th century in London's history, is incredibly interesting um, for a number of reasons. But I think the most important one is that London was a city of two and a half million people. And it was the largest city that had, that on, on, the, on the face of the planet at that point, but it was also the largest city that had ever been built. And so the Victorians were trying to kind of live through and, and simultaneously invent a whole new scale of living, the scale of living that we you know, now call metropolitan living. Um, and it was, in many ways, at this point in the mid-1850s, a complete disaster. Um, they were basically a city living with a modern kind of industrial metropolis with an Elizabethan public infrastructure. Um, so people, for instance, just to gross you out for a second, uh, <laughs> Had, had cesspools of human waste in their basement, uh, like a foot to two feet deep. Um, and they would just kind of throw the buckets down there uh, and hope that it would somehow go away. And of course, it never really would go away. Um, and all of this stuff basically had, had accumulated to the point where the city was in incredibly offensive to just walk around in. It was an amazingly smelly city, um, not just because of the cesspools, but also the, the sheer number of livestock in the city would shock people, not just the horses, but people had cows in their attics that they would use for milk that they would kind of hoist up there and keep them in the attic until, until literally their milk went out and they died, and then they would kind of drag them off. Uh, to the you know the bone boilers down the street, um, so uh, you would just walk around London at this point and just be overwhelmed with this with, with this stench. And what ended up happening is that an entire kind of emerging public health system became convinced that it was the smell that was that was killing everybody, that was creating these diseases that would kind of wipe through the city every three or four years. And cholera was really the great killer of this period. It had arrived in London in 1832. And every four or five years, another epidemic would take 10,000, 20,000 people in, in London and, and throughout the UK. And so the authorities became convinced that this, this smell was this problem. We had to get rid of the smell. Um, and so, in fact, they, they concocted a couple of early, you know, kind of founding public health interventions in the system of the city, um, one of which was called the Nuisances Act, which they got everybody, as far as they could, to empty out their cesspools and uh, just pour all that waste into the river. Because if we get it out of the streets, it'll smell much better. And oh, right, we drink from the river. 
Um, so what ended up happening actually is, is they ended up increasing the outbreaks of cholera because as we now know, cholera is actually in the water. It's a waterborne disease, not something that's in the air. It's not something you smell or inhale. It's something you ingest. And so the, one of the founding moments of kind of public health in, in the 19th century effectively poisoned the water supply of London much more effectively than any modern day bioterrorist could have ever dreamed of doing. So at, at this, this was kind of the state of London in 1854. And in, in the middle of all this kind of carnage and uh, offensive conditions, and, and in the midst of all this kind of scientific confusion about what was actually killing people, there was a very uh, in a talented classic 19th century uh, multidisciplinarian named John Snow who was a local doctor in, in Soho in London, who had been arguing for about four or five years that cholera was, in fact, a waterborne disease, and had basically convinced nobody of this. Um, the public health authorities had largely ignored what he had to say. And he'd made the case in a number of papers and done a number of studies, um, but nothing had really kind of stuck. And part of the, what's so interesting about this story to me is, is that in some ways, it's a great case study in how cultural change happens, how a good idea eventually comes to win out over, over much worse ideas. Um, and Snow labored for a long time with this great insight that everybody kind of ignored. And then on one day, August 28th of, of 1854, a young child, a five-month-old girl, whose, whose first name we don't know, we know her only as Baby Lewis, um, somehow contracted cholera, came down with cholera at 40 Broad Street. You can't really see it in this, in this map, but this is, this is the map that becomes the central kind of focus in, in the second half of my book. So in the middle of Soho, in this working class neighborhood, this little girl becomes sick. And it turns out that the cesspool that they still continue to have, despite the Nuisances Act, uh, bordered on an extremely popular uh, water pump, local watering hole, that was well known for the best water in all of Soho, that all the residents from Soho and the surrounding neighborhoods would go to. And so this little girl inadvertently ended up contaminating the water in this popular pump. And one of the most terrifying outbreaks in the history of, uh, of England erupted about two or three days later. Literally 10% of the neighborhood died in, in seven days. And much more would have died if people hadn't fled after the, after the initial kind of outbreak kind of kicked in. Um, so it was this incredibly terrifying event. You had these scenes of entire families dying over the course of 48 hours of cholera alone in their one-room apartments, um, in their little flats. Um, just an, an extraordinary, terrifying scene. Snow lived near there heard about the outbreak, and in this amazing kind of act of courage, went directly into the belly of the beast, because he thought an outbreak that concentrated could actually potentially end up convincing people that, in fact, the, the, the real menace of, of cholera was, was in the water supply and, and not in the air. He suspected an outbreak that concentrated would probably involve a single point source, one single thing that, that everybody was going to, because it didn't have the kind of the, the traditional slower path of kind of infections that, that you might expect. And so he went right in there and, and, and started interviewing people. He eventually enlisted the, the help kind of, of, of this amazing other figure who's kind of the other protagonist of the book, this guy, Henry Whitehead, who was a local minister, who was not at all a man of science, but it was incredibly socially connected. He knew everybody in the neighborhood. And he managed to track down, Whitehead did, many of the cases of people who had drunk water from the pump or who hadn't drunk water from the pump. And eventually, Snow made a, a map of the outbreak. He, he found increasingly that people who drank from the pump were getting sick. People who hadn't drunk from the pump were not getting sick. And he thought about kind of representing that as a kind of a table of statistics of people living in different neighborhoods, people who hadn't, you know, percentages of people who hadn't. But eventually he hit upon the idea that what he needed was something that you could see, something that would take, in a sense, a higher level view of all this activity that had been happening in the neighborhood. And so he created this, this map, um, which basically ended up representing all the deaths in the neighborhoods as black bars at each address. And you can see in this map the pump right at the center of it. And you can see that one of the residents down the way had about 15 people dead. Um, and as you, the map is actually a little bit bigger. As you get further and further away from the pump, the, the deaths begin to uh, grow less and less frequent. And so you can see this kind of something poisonous kind of emanating out of this pump that you could see in a glance. And so with the help of this map and with the help of kind of more kind of evangelizing that he did over the, in the next few years and that Whitehead did, Eventually, actually, the authorities slowly started to come around. It took much longer than sometimes uh, we like to think in this story. But by 1866, 
When the next big cholera outbreak came to London, the authorities had been convinced, in, in part because of this story, in part because of this map, um, that in fact the water was the problem. And they had already started building the sewers in London. And they immediately went to this outbreak and they told everybody to start boiling their water. And that was the last time that London has seen a cholera outbreak since. So part of this story, I think, well, it's a terrifying story. It's a very dark story. And it's a story that continues on in many of the developing cities of the, the world. It's also a story, really, that is fundamentally optimistic, which is to say that it's possible to solve these problems if we listen to reason, if we listen to the kind of wisdom of these kinds of maps, if we listen to people like Snow and Whitehead, if we listen to the locals who understand what's going on in, in these kinds of situations. And what it ended up doing is making the idea of large-scale metropolitan living a sustainable one. When people were looking at 10% of their neighborhoods dying in the space of seven days, there was a, a widespread consensus that this couldn't go on, that people weren't meant to live in cities of two and a half million people. But because of what Snow did, because of this map, because of the whole series of kind of reforms that happened in the wake of this map, we now take for granted that cities of 10 million people, cities like this one, are in fact sustainable things. We don't worry that New York City is going to collapse in on itself quite the way that you know, Rome did and, and be 10% of its size in 100 years or 200 years. And so that, in a, in a way, is the ultimate legacy of this map. It's, it's, a, it's a map of deaths that ended up creating a whole new way of life, the life that, that we're enjoying here today. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed that video. I thought it was kind of interesting, and you know, I, I uh, wanted to make sure I took the time so you could take a look at that. Um, more than 71% of the world is comprised of water. If the Earth was the size of a basketball, all of its water would fit into a ping pong ball. So as you can see, the comparison. So most of our world is water. Most of, our, most of the Earth is water. But how much of it can we actually use? Only 3% of our global water resources are fresh water. 3%, 97% are salt water. And salt, wa salty water is not suitable. We cannot drink salty water. So what can we do with it? They're all different uh, types of interventions, um, desalinization, and different ways to try to bring, pull, extract the salt from the water. But uh, most of our, our water is, um, is salty, unfortunately. And most of our fresh water can be found in the polar ice caps. 70% um, of it can be found in the polar ice caps. 30% can be found within soil moisture, aquifers, rivers, and lakes. And agriculture uses 70% of all global water. 70%. That's huge. All the, the industry is um, domestic is 10%, 20% is, is industry, but 70% is agriculture. They take a huge chunk of water. And war, our world is getting drier and drier and drier. And this is from 1980 to 200 to 2015. I tried to find an updated um, map, but I couldn't find one. But as you can see, uh, the green areas indicate um, intensely um, with uh, a, a great deal of water. And the uh, yellow and dark yellow and the um, red indicate um, less and less water. And the gray points, of course, are no data. And you can see in many areas that just don't have data, like in, um, like in Africa. But you can see more and more red. It's getting drier and drier. So we got to think about our water usage. Sorry about that. Um, this is a slide I shared, we shared with you um, on our first class. Water levels are falling. It's 3 to 10 feet per year in India. And I just love, I love this um, image. It was from National Geographic from Gujarat, India. Um, they get less than 8 inches of rainfall each year. And summer temperatures soar to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is a, a well right there with everyone dropping their buckets to try to get a tiny bit of water. Can you imagine that? And these are their buckets. And to carry them all the way back to their home every time they use water. Just so intense. Uh, increasing numbers of people are living with water stress. In fact, in two, by 2030, 47% of our entire world's population will be in this water stress. Four billion people. So it's really, it's getting worse and worse. 
Uh, and more than 3.4 billion people die each year from water, sanitation, and hygiene-related causes, and 99% of these occur in the developing world. Um, and think about this, an American taking a five-minute shower, five minutes, which isn't even that long, uses more water than the average person in a developing country slum would use for an entire day. An entire day. Water is so precious. Like in Thailand, when I had no water, when there was, when the only water I had was the water that was infested with, with larvae, all different types of larvae, that, although it was filled with bugs, I didn't care because that's all the water we had. So you make, you know, tons of use of whatever you have. Um, many people around the world lack access to clean water. In fact, 2.5 billion people lack access to improved sanitation. And more than 1 billion people still practice open defecation. So they still go to the bathroom outside um, because they either don't have toilets or um, it's, uh, it's, un you know, it's unsafe. And I remember in the refugee camp where I worked, the, my, many of my students would go to the bathroom and... Um, they, we didn't have many toilets, but and the folks just didn't feel comfortable using them, and they would just go off on the side of my classroom, it was a hut, and go to the bathroom. Or sometimes I'd go to the bathroom on my floor, and I'd say, please no, especially the children. I'd say, mignon, mignon, don't do that. Children, out of the classroom, you cannot go to the bathroom in my classroom. But um, more than a billion people still go to the bathroom outside. Of the 60 million people added to the world's towns and cities each year, remember, a growing middle class, of these 60 million people, most move from very rural um, areas to informal settlements, i.e. slums, uh, with no sanitation facilities. So they're moving into the middle class, but they don't have bathrooms, etc. 780 million people lack access to an improved um, uh, water source, that's about one in nine people. And a water and sanitation crisis claims more lives through the disease than any war through guns. Any war through guns. And more people have a mobile phone than a toilet. Everyone has a mobile phone these days, but they don't have toilets. At least 1.8 million billion people, billion, 1.8 billion, use a drinking water source contaminated with feces. 1.8 billion people. Think about what happens when you drink water contaminated with feces and all the issues that ensue. Um, world, this is another image I found um, on the internet. Um, world toilet day alert, feces contaminated water. And here, this is a bathroom from, uh, where is this from? Uh, Ferdinand And uh, they, it's just a toilet, which it's a bathroom, which is set up on, on the river. And it just goes into the water. And this is a, um, a bathroom in Bangladesh. And I have to say, I remember I went with one of my um, students, with another teacher, down to his village um, that was on the Chao Phraya River um, outside Bangkok. And we were so excited to go for spring break to meet with his family. They were so gracious. And they lived right on the river, and they had a little store right on the river. But also, we would um, we got up that day, um, we got up in the morning, and we all bathed in the river. And their boats going by, you up Nam in the river, and then we would wash our clothes in the river, and um, everything kind of took place on the river. And the interesting thing was that the outhouse, the bathroom, was also situated on the river. So as I'm showering, I'm bathing in the water in the morning, I see that up the road, the neighbor's bathroom was also on the river, so they would use the bathroom and the water would then come down to us and we were using it to bathe our children and the clothes and ourselves. So um, it's a part of life, but that's just, that's why people get sick, unfortunately. It was a great experience, but it um, really makes you think. Um, and there's also a tremendous impact of water sanitation on women. Women and children spend 125 million hours each day collecting water, each day. In many countries, women are responsible for finding and collecting water for their families. All the water they need for drinking, washing, cooking, and cleaning is carried by women in their containers on their head or in their arms, usually on their head, back to their house. They sometimes have to walk miles to get water. Um, the work is breathtaking and all-consuming. Often the water is contaminated, even deadly. In these instances, they face an impossible choice. Certain death without water or possible death from illness. So what would you do? Of course you're going to drink the water. 
And once they're old enough, girls join in on this water effort and spend hours trying to provide this basic um, necessity of life. Women also struggle from a lack of adequate sanitation, which is the unspoken part of the water and sanitation crisis. Um, and it can be summed up one word, dignity. So around the world, as we said, you know, less fewer than one in three have people uh, have access to a toilet. And many countries, it's not acceptable for women to relieve themselves during the day. So you cannot go to the bathroom if you're a woman it, because someone will see you. So some will, people just hold it and hold it till night falls so they can go in the bushes and um, go to the bathroom. So they wait for hours and hours and hours just to have a small bit of privacy. So think about how hard that is. Um, it impacts their health and it puts their lives at risk. 50% of all girls attend school without toilets. And the lack of access, lack of privacy causes many of these girls to drop out when they reach puberty. So when they start menstruating and they can't use the bathroom and they can't relieve themselves, they just can't go to school. There's no way around it. It's this dual aspect, the water crisis, the lack of water and sanitation. They lock women in a cycle of poverty. They can't attend school. They can't earn an income. They're stuck. Their water is enslaving women. And also, you know, as I noted, it impacts the girls that can't go to school. Um, and here are some children here. They um, can't go to school because they're responsible for water. Uh, and once again, just highlighting the same um, issue, I found this graphic with the top indicating limited access to clean water versus access to clean water for women and girls. So on the top, limited access. A mother and her unborn child are subject to dehydration and malnourishment during pregnancy, and both may suffer from carrying heavy loads of water long distances. A mother risks her life in labor. She and her child also face a higher risk of infection due to unsanitary conditions. Um, a young girl is likely to be chronically hungry and thirsty. Um, she must help her water co mother collect water up to eight hours a day, which leaves no time for school. A young woman may drop out of school at puberty because there's no adequate sanitation facilities available, or by first forced to leave by her family who need her to help carry water. And for each year of school she missed, a woman lost 10 to 20% of her future potential earning income. The less education a girl has, the more likely she is to marry and against her will and have more children. That's without water. And then if you have more water, if they, you do have access to water, how that changes a woman's life. From pregnancy to birth, childhood, adolescence to adulthood. They're healthy and educated. A woman can pursue further educational, personal, educational, personal, professional goals as desired. If and when she decides to have children, she's less likely to die in childbirth or contract HIV AIDS and her children are more likely to survive. So, I, I love this graphic, so I wanted to share that with you. Um, and another graphic on children in general, diarrheal disease is the second leading cause of death of children under five. And it's, sorry, it's preventable and treatable. So it's the second leading cause of death for children under five. And it's a shame because it is preventable. Every 20 seconds, a child under five will die from a preventable waterborne illness. It's more than HIV, AIDS, malaria, and TB combined. Lack of access to clean water and sanitation kills children at a rate equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every four hours. 443 million school days are lost each year due to water-related illness. And here's our jet taking off. Kills more, chil more children than a jet. And this is a map we've um, seen before. It's deaths attributed to water sanitation dehydration for children under five. 50% um, of malnutrition is related to repeated diarrhea or intestinal nematode infections as well as unclean water, clean sanitation, um, unclean water, poor sanitation or hygiene. 1.8 million die from diarrheal disease. 90% of children are five, uh, mostly developing countries. Just reiterating the same, same point. Uh, and then I just wanted to highlight and share with you some waterborne diseases associated with unclean water. And I know you've all studied these in your public health classes in the past. Um, they're caused by pathogenic microbes spread in the water, the contaminated water, and many times they cause dis, um, diarrhea. 88% um, of diarrheal cases worldwide are linked to unsafe water, inadequate sanitation, or insufficient hygiene. Um, and these are just some uh, examples of waterborne diseases associated with unclean water. Cholera, salmonella, typhoid, just keeps going on and on and on. 
And then um, these are diseases um, associated with water as well, but they are vector or insect borne diseases. So because water, as you know, plays a critical role in the spread of these diseases because insects such as mosquitoes breed around water. Like the water I had in Chiang Mai in my urns that I used every day, they were contaminated with these um, insects and uh, not, they're not healthy. Um, infected insects transmit deadly disease to humans through their bite, like Zika, malaria, dengue fever, West Nile, cephalitis. And these are some examples of Zika and malaria and so on. Um, I thought this was fascinating, the no lube, no, lube, no I do, um, India's total sanitation campaign. And um, India has been working for um, over a decade to try to increase um, the population using toilets. And there's been a big resistance to using toilets. Um, they'd rather go outside. There are all these different reasons, but one public health campaign they increased was the no lou I do, trying to encourage women to um, make sure that their potential spouse has a toilet. Um, and a, you know, their Bollywood, which is like the Indian form um, Hollywood, a famous actress, Vijay Balan, she's spreading the national TV campaign sponsored by the government. Um, and she plays, she kind of acts, she plays, um, play, plays an educated villager who praises another villager for leaving her husband's home, which lacked an indoor latrine and returning to her parents' house. So they're trying to push to encourage educated young women to demand that their their future husbands have a toilet. This was from the um, Huffington Post. Um, clean, safe water is very, very expensive. This is um, a slum in Africa where they sell water. And I've seen that many times all around Southeast Asia. You can buy water um, by the bag. Um, as I as we were discussing at the beginning of the presentation, I asked you to think about the true water, water cost of food and produced um, items because it's often hidden. A glass of milk requires 200 liters of water to produce, a cup of coffee, 140 liters of water, a slice of bread up is 40, um, an egg, one egg requires 135 liters of water, and a hamburger. A hamburger requires 2,400 uh, liters of water to produce. And we discussed this in the first uh, lecture, but I wanted to bring it back again just to, uh, to reiterate. And here, I thought this was interesting. It, it takes 10 liters of water to make one, one sheet of paper, one sheet of water, one sheet of paper, excuse me, and to make a pair of jeans, it requires 10,855 liters of water to make one pair of jeans, just one. That's tremendous. I also want to share with you the Millennium Development Goal associated with clean water. And um, as you know, the Millennium Development Goals ended uh, last year in 2015. Now we're faced upon the, um, the SDGs. But for the MDG, Goal 7 was um, focused on improving water. Here we are. It was under the Ensure Environmental Sustainability Goal. Uh, and they had said by um, half by 2015, the proportion of the population without sustainable access to water, drinking water, and basic sanitation. So this was um, in the past, and now we are focused on sustainable development goals as of 2016. And here we have goal six, ensure access to water and sanitation for all. And the targets are... So if you go once again to the UN website, to the Sustainable Development Goals site, you can find all 17 goals, and each of them has associated targets, and these are the targets associated with Goal 6. By 2030, achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all. And this is enforced by the UN, with all the UN countries working together to achieve their goals. And these are the, um, excuse me, the targets. Um, this is a video by Matt Damon. It's, it's quite funny. Um, and if you can answer this, what intervention has saved the most lives ever? So according to Matt Damon, what was that invention? Let's take a look at the video. The website's down here if you want to take a look at it. It's quite funny. It's about two, a little more than two minutes. It's also on our Blackboard site. Quick. What invention saved the most lives in human history? Uh, penicillin? Nope. Seatbelt? Uh-uh. Condom? Try again. Smallpox vaccine? The answer is the can. 
the John, the porcelain throne, the bog, the foreign office, the Thomas Crapper. That's right, the toilet. Whatever you choose to call it, the toilet not only provides a tranquil escape from nagging bosses, spouses, and children, it's also a fast and sanitary way to dispose of waste, separate from the water we drink and bathe in. Hey, buddy, how about a courtesy flush? But in most of the world, toilets are still a luxury. In fact, more people have cell phones than toilets. One billion people, about 20% of the world's population, defecate in the open. In rural areas, the number jumps to one in three. And it's not because they're free spirits or enjoy a gentle breeze on the backside. Without toilets, human waste and bacteria seep into the water supply, which makes people sick, especially kids. Everyone knows you don't take a Nixon where you eat. Well, you shouldn't take one where you drink either. Unfortunately, millions of people don't have a choice. Half of the world's hospital beds are occupied by patients with water-related diseases, such as diarrhea and intestinal infection. These diseases kill 10,000 people a day, nearly all of whom are in the developing world. In fact, water and sanitation problems claim more lives than guns do in wars. And yes, death by diarrhea is as pleasant as it sounds. But nearly three quarters of the earth is covered in water. So what's the big deal? Why is a clean source of drinking water so hard to come by? For starters, 97% of the earth's water is salt water, leaving only 3% to bathe in and drink. And only 8% of that is unpolluted. On average, people in the developing world walk four miles a day for clean water. These people are almost always women. Imagine waiting in line at the DMV every day of your life. Transporting fresh water to populated areas and keeping it clean is expensive. One in nine people lack access to safe water, double the population of the U.S. The good news is that much of this disease, dehydration, and diarrhea is preventable. Organizations like Water.org are dedicated to solving this crisis, hence the .org but they need funds. So the next time you're drinking fancy bottled water from the South Pacific or moving your stocks while moving your bowels, take a moment to consider that the water six inches beneath your butt is cleaner than the drinking water of one billion of your neighbors. So celebrate your can, because you can. And would it kill you to donate a few bucks and maybe light a match? That was a funny video. <laughs> Thanks for um, I also want to share with you some instant, uh, interesting data I found from the World Economic Forum. On one of, their uh, one of their recent surveys, they listed water crises as the largest global risk in terms of potential impact. So the Global Risk Perception Survey, so this is data that were collected from 2014, um, from July through September of 2014, among World and Economic Forum multitask communities of leaders from business, government, academia, um, non-government, inter international organizations. So a number of real key thought leaders around the world were asked about what the biggest risks were. And here are the websites and the publications associated with these data, if you want to take a look at it. But um, it's interesting because um, this is the global risk landscape that pertains to one of the questions from the survey. And they found water crisis, wrong with this, goodness, this website, um, as you can see, it is the most, it was the big, one of the biggest risks. Um, this is the likelihood and the impact of the disaster associated with water crises. And also we have um, the global risk interconnected map. Once again, data gleaned from this survey from key thought leaders around the world. And they identified water crises as another big issue. You can see it's kind of like the eight bubbles we had on um, our first lecture. You know, climate change, um, man-made catastrophes, spread of infectious diseases, migration, all coming together and water crises are, are right there in the middle, having a huge impact. So now I want to, um, you may be asking, why invest in water and sanitation? Why, why should we invest here? What's the economic um, argument? Well, there's a huge ROI, a big return on investment for water investment. For every $1 invested in water and sanitation, there's a $4 economic return on investment, one to four. That's pretty substantial. And every dollar invested in eliminating open defecation in rural areas provides a $6 economic return. Um, for every dollar invested in providing universal access to basic sanitation at home, will provide a $3 economic return. So there's a big economic argument supporting water and sanitation. It's a great area to focus. I mean, this would be a great area to write a grant in the future. Um, it's huge because water, as you know, is high on the list of our world leaders, so there's going to be funding to support water-related interventions. And also, there's the 
health argument supporting water and sanitation, why we need to focus on this. Improved health for women and girls would ensue because they no longer have to delay defecation and urination. They don't have to wait all day till nightfall to use the restroom. Reduce child and maternal mortality as a result of access to safe water, sanitation facilities, and improved hygiene during childbirth. There's an increased dignity in reduced psychological stress for girls and women, particularly when symptoms associated with menstruation, pregnancy, and childbirth can be managed discreetly in their own homes, in their own bathrooms. There's reduced physical injury from the constant lifting and then carrying heavy loads of water on their heads, on their backs, and reduced risk of rape, sexual assault, and increased safety as women and girls don't have to go to very remote, dark, dangerous places to defecate or to fetch water during the night. I read an article um, recently about an old woman who was blind and she would have to wait to go to the bathroom until it was very, in Africa, till it was dark and she would have to wait for a friend to come to take her out and how scared she was and all the health problems that were ensuing because she would hold and not go to the bathroom until her friend came until it was dark. I mean, it's so, so sad, so sad. And we just can't wait. We cannot wait for improved sanitation. We must act now. And I thought this graphic was kind of, it says it all. Um, we've got the global issues, the menstrual hygiene issues, water station hygiene issues, which is WASH, W-A-S-H, and education. It's huge. So um, this is a, uh, it's a great campaign to promote summing up all, all our issues, why we need to promote water and sanitation. And then also um, our fantastic Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been um, supporting a reinvent the toilet competition that's fostered a new focus on sanitation. What they were trying to do, and they've been doing this for a couple of years now, was to um, have a grant. They actually submitted an RFP, a request, request for proposal, um, to get people to start thinking about sanitation. They, are, they have funds to support research to develop truly aspirational next-generation next toilets that do not require a sewer or water connection or electricity, and they cost less than five cents per user per day, and they're designed to, pe to meet the people's needs. Most of the projects use chemical engineering processes for energy and resource recovery for, weight, for human waste. They've got a number of really interesting videos on the Bill and Melinda Gates um, Foundation website. You can take a look at some of the winning grants that have been sued in the past. I mean, they're great. They're so innovative, and this is what we need. You know, low-cost options for um, rural areas where people really need some help. So this is uh, a great... Um, grant funding request that uh, I applaud Bill and Melinda Gates for uh, tackling. And today we're also going to be uh, focusing on our, um, our case study, Preventing Diarrheal Deaths in Egypt. And what I'd love for you to do is to read the, um, there's a PDF on our website, take a look at that, and then there are four questions for discussion. Respond to those four um, questions and then respond to at least two of your colleagues on their responses to the case study, um, just so we can learn more about um, the oral rehydration solution and what happened in Egypt and what lessons can be learned from Egypt. So take a look at that when you get a chance. And now I'd like to discuss with you the final project program components. We, as I've mentioned, we have completed three of the 10 components. And for this module, we will focus on our, um, and here we are, three that we've done. We've done the literature review, the needs assessment, and the target population. We've done three of the 10, and this checklist is on Blackboard. And we still need to do for this module our charitable purpose, goals, and objectives, and our monitoring and evaluation plan. And these should be linked together. And so we'll have completed five of the 10 components after this module. So our charitable purpose is your grand statement. What are you going to do? Your goals are broad and sweeping. Your objectives are specific and measurable. 
and a monitoring evaluation plan should be linked to the goals and objectives. They must be appropriate and measurable. Let's take a look at these. Shareable purpose. This is the actual grant application that's available on Blackboard as well, or I can, if you want, I can email it to you if you can't find it. But one of the first questions is, what is your charitable purpose? And for many people who apply for grants, you have your own 501c3, your own nonprofit organization. Um, if you don't, maybe you're partnering with a 501c3 who might be doing something similar in, in nature, and maybe they're more established, maybe they have more funding, maybe they have more staff, more resources, et cetera. But what I want you to do and what they want you to do is figure out what is the charitable purpose of your organization. So if you're going to create, for the purposes of this project, you can say you're going to create your own 501c3 if you want. Um, and so come up with what is your purpose? What are you going to do? Um, so as I mentioned, to be registered as a charity, your organization must have a charitable purpose or purposes. So your 501c3, your not-for-profit organization, has to do something. Why are you forming? Why are you incorporating yourself as a 501c3? What's your big, broad purpose? Um, it's basically what your organization has been set up to achieve. It's also referred to as the organization's mission. Many of you have heard mission. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates on this grant, call it the purpose, you can call it the mission, but it's basically the same thing. And this is an example I found. It's very long and lengthy, but I just want to give you one example that's actually been out there. Um, the prevention or relief of poverty of young people living in greater London who are socially excluded in particular by providing grants to provide them with an opportunity to build capacity by establishing and growing a business to relieve their needs and help them to integrate into society. This is an example of a 501c3 from London, and this is their purpose, but there are many different purposes, and I'd be happy to brainstorm with you on your organization's purpose. Um, a charitable purpose is the reason why a charity has been set up and what its activities work towards achieving. What outcomes your charity set up to achieve? Oh, I'm sorry. How it will achieve the outcomes? Who will benefit from the outcomes? Where the benefits extend to? So, for instance, advancing the health, education, religion, culture, or social, or public welfare, or promoting or protecting human rights, or any purpose beneficial to the public. Your purpose needs to be clear and easy for people outside your, outside your organization to understand. So you can have a one sentence purpose to combat HIV AIDS in a certain, certain area or whatever you, you would like to do. That's for your grant for, this, uh, for the purpose. Here are some examples from students in the past. To improve the health of, this is the, um, my one student, Carly, who did the refugee website project. To improve the health of incoming refugees in the Jacksonville area by, provide, by providing key information pivotal to maneuvering through the local health care system. And her sub goal, this will improve the health of the Jacksonville community overall and reduce health care costs in the area through interactive tools and education for the refugee population. Another example. Oh, sorry, I'll show you some more examples in a moment. Let me just go through the goals and objectives. And this is the from the goals and objectives checklist, which is on Blackboard as well. So a goal, what is a goal? So we've got the, the, the purpose of the mission, then we have the goals, then we have the objectives. So we talked about the purpose, the goals, basically their future event toward which a committed endeavor is directed. And what are your objectives? They're concrete steps taken in pursuit of that goal. The goals are encompassing, they're realistic, they're clearly stated, they provide a direction for our program, um, they're not measurable, that's important, they're not measurable, they're not time bound. But the objectives, on the other hand, are, and they must be SMART, and I don't know if you've heard this in the past, but SMART objectives are S, specific, M, measurable, A, attainable, attainable, R, relevant, and T, time bound. So specific, you're specific to what you're going to be doing. They're measurable, so you have date, you're going to achieve your goal by what date. They're attainable, so they have to be, you have to be able to achieve your objectives, and they're relevant, they're important, they matter, and they're time bound. So when are you gonna do it? Is it six months, is it a year, is it um, two years? When will you achieve your objectives? They must be smart. Um, and some more examples, so we have our purpose, our goals, and our objectives. Our objectives, some examples of language, increase in awareness, increase in knowledge, change in attitudes or behaviors, 
development of a health skill, increase access, reduced risk, risk improve health status, um, and then elements of an objective. So this is just some more ideas on how you actually write them. And um, an and objective, this is another scenario of how to write an objective. I, I'm presenting this as kind of going on and on and on. But you have the outcome to achieve, what are you gonna do? Your target, who are you gonna do it to? Condition, when you're gonna do it. Your criteria, how much you're gonna, how much you're going to do it. And then equals a well-written objective. So they have all these different pieces that come together to be smart. It's another way of saying that objectives need to be smart. Um, this is from our Bill and Melinda. It's the application again, the grant application. This was our table of contents. We talked about child of purpose. Um, we're not going to do the executive summary. That's going to be the last piece. Our context is like the literature review and the needs assessment. And then we have the framework, which is composed of our goals, objectives, and our results. And this is the table right here that we're going to be focusing on. And this is our checklist for, this is like the goals section, the evaluation plan. Um, make sure that you've described how you plan to evaluate the success of your program. You've decided what you want to um, assess. You've selected an evaluation design for your program. Um, you use, I mean, there's so many different ways to evaluate your program. Are you going to have a knowledge tool and you're going to distribute it before your program and after your program and evaluate how much your students, your participants learn? Are you going to have a behavior approach? For instance, that people know to um, take their medications at a certain time and how long they're going to do. There's so many different ways to evaluate your program. And I'd be happy to discuss the elements of your program uh, to talk about it. So let me give you some more. Um, ex and so anyway, this is the grant. We'll be filling these components is in within your application. I just wanted to show you how they fit in together. So this is the result of the monitoring evaluation, another example. This is from Carly's um, program. She's going to evaluate her program. Remember, it was, web, it was the website. So hers is a little different. But she's going to have a number of focus groups of both the refugees and the caseworkers who will test that website to validate ease of use four different times throughout the life of the project. So she pulled together a group of refugees and refugee leaders who um, she could go to at least four different points over time. And the feedback from the sessions, sessions would be integrated into the website to ensure maximum leverage for the target population. And then for a period of six months um, throughout the project timeline, the team would update the information um, for the case managers, and there'd be five versions of this program developed and deployed over the two-year period. So anyway, this was her evaluation plan. I just wanted to share with you. And then um, I want to share with you a totally different type of program, which I'd be happy to, uh, if anyone wants to look at this project, I have it for you. Um, another one of my favorite students, it was a suicide prevention program in Guyana. Um, her mission statement, she had a large, the purpose of the suicide prevention program was to provide adolescents in Guyana with the emotional support, knowledge, and skill set to prevent suicide. And it goes on and on and on. She's got our goal. Reduce suicide rates among 15 to 24 year olds through a program designed to minimize suicide behaviors and enhance social support among at risk individuals in Burbis, Guyana. Then she had one objective and she broke them out into um, impact, it was an impact with uh, focus on learner, learning and behavioral, sorry, and then outcomes. And our outcome two years after program limitation, suicide rates in this. Um, once a city in Guyana among this cohort of 15, 24 four year olds would decrease by 10%. So this is kind of how she set it up. I thought it was another good example. Let me show you one more. Um, this is from the malaria program. Objective one, um, to reduce Lofa counties, that's where it's implemented, um, malaria morbidity by 50% and reduce mortality by 75% by 2015. This was a couple years ago and um, reduce by 50% the number of people who are medicating for malaria without first testing for the disease. Anyway, and they had a problem and their outcomes, um, their hypothesis was, we can provide the population with an inexpensive, non-invasive rapid testing system for malaria and begin treatment before complication sets in, then we can decrease the deaths and complications of the disease and prevent toxicity and unnecessary use of medication. 
So anyway, another great example of how to tie in goals and objectives um, with the outcomes and the results that were measured. So anyway, I've got many examples. If uh, you and your team would like to uh, review them, I'd be happy to bring them to you and meet with you. Um, just give me a call to get a chance. But anyway, this concludes our Module 6 uh, presentation on water and sanitation around the world. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, I look forward to your next two components of your final project. And have a great day. Thank you.